Welcome everybody to Aeon Bite. Yeah, get thee to a nunnery and get the Gnostic Tarot, as you've seen by the introduction. If you're watching on video, my name is Miguel Connor and I am your Pompidus of Gnosis. That smell of colitas rising through the air of a world gone mad. But here you are, as uh, Jung said, to cure yourself from your sanity. Because what you've been told is always ain't that close to the truth. And uh, with us today, someone who has always fought for the truth, for the reality behind the reality, for the greater picture, for the dignity of humanity and the soul and the mind, is Alex Sakiris. Alex, thank you very much. Yes, it's been too long and so great to see you. Miguel, it's great to be back with you. And uh your, your voice, no matter if we're apart, is always uh, ringing in my head in various ways. So it's cool. <laughs> yeah, the people tell me I have a great voice. But as we were talking about families before the show, if only my kids and my wife thought my voice was charming and enticing and commanding. But no, no. Different reality, right? <laughs> Exactly. what they see and what we experience and with us too it is great to have graham to help us out today as the moondog vans is still on vacation for another week or so graham thanks for being here oh always a pleasure Miguel. a chance to shuffle through some of the scrolls and uh you know again looking forward to hearing about you know ai i always try to remind myself you know well, AI is at least intelligence, and that beats a lot of the people out there. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think uh, Alex's book deals with uh, Alan Turing and uh, the Turing test, but if somebody said maybe we need to have a human test because most people today might not even pass as humans. Right, Alex? <laughs> Everybody's well, turning yeah. into a replicant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of different... I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think the Turing test, I mean, if you want to jump really, really both feet deep dive, I think the Turing test is is fascinating because uh, it's misunderstood. There's a key part of it, a really key part of it that everybody overlooks. Even AI overlooked when I had to uh, interact with it. And that's that uh, I'll jump right into that story, if you will. So, yeah, and when, you know, yeah. Let me just yeah. uh, in, get the audience primed, uh, especially those of you in there joining in the chats. So good to see everybody. Please, if you have any questions for Alex, super chat them so Graham can see them and get to them, and uh, we'll get to that too. And yeah, for those of you wondering if you haven't read the intro, the promo, Alex is here to discuss his book, Why AI. Is smartest is dangerous and divine and as i told alex the book was a pleasant shock as i did not expect this and i walked away so much the better man or more curious person and more uh, enlightened in many ways so definitely check out the book the links in the show notes and what i like about your book alex too is that it's different and you can explain that but it's still very skeptical uh, it was almost like i got this amazing tour of all the themes that you've been fighting for non-local intelligence ndes it had the usual suspects like uh dean raiden and uh, so forth so i it was again it's like almost like i got a two bonus or two two level uh, rewards for reading your for for your book Oh, that's that's very nice of you to say. And you know, by the way, for uh, because I love my my Gnostic brothers, and I especially love you, Miguel. I the the book is going to be ninety nine cents uh, for a couple days right after this. So anyone who wants to just grab it, it's as low as it, and the paperback is as low as I can get it. Make no money on it. But um, <laughs> you you know what I thought, and the way I reached out to you. Um, so we'll have a a good chat, but. I'm interested in this uh, intersection that might come about. So we have to talk about the basics. But, you know, I, I kind of sent you that pre-roll that I did with AI. I said, hey, I'm talking to Miguel, and I have all these connections that I'm making with Gnosticism on all these different layers, on all these different levels, on the kind of surface level of 
oh my gosh, this is Prometheus, you know, kind of thing. Uh, this is the bringer of life. This is Lucifer. Kind of, and then there's on this kind of deeper level of uh, transhumanism and that agenda and who are the people, humans behind that. So I, I'm, I'm in this to pull from you, uh, kind of your insights. And then, you know, I listen, it, it, but then there's this other house cleaning we've got to do. Cause I like, I listened to your interview with, uh, Jason, Jason Giorgiani and, uh, mm. There, there's a lot of people in, uh, I'll say your community, because it is your community more than my community, that just don't get it wrong. I mean, Jason, I love Jason. He's been on the show. He's a brilliant guy, but they don't understand AI. And I think there's a ton of people in your community that don't understand it, are spinning off into this kind of sentient kind of, and that whole path of where that takes them, which I, I Everyone's entitled to their own uh, opinion, but you got to be in this, you know, we need to be grounded in some basic facts about how things work, you know? And I mean, like, you can't pretend like your car works a different way than it works. You know, it, it works the way that it works. You can't identify as your car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You can identify as your car. You just yeah, can't you go can. and fix it if you don't know how it works. Yeah, yeah, very true. No, I agree. Yeah, and the perspectives are amazing. Yeah, you, Jason Reza Georgiani has very fascinating perspectives. We've had James Tunney, who, of course, has a different James True. So we've had all these voices from an esoteric, mystic point of view. But uh, so why don't we get down to the bones? Oh, and of course, again, what I love about your book, again, is bring up things like, I didn't know Alan Turing was into ESP, but it makes sense. Any person who has any brains is going to realize, again, the human mind is the human mind. But uh, what what would you say is the thing that uh, people on the esoteric side are getting wrong about AI? That it's a computer program. That's it. <laughs> That's it. It's a computer program. You know, oh man, but you, alien tech and transdimensional owl maybe. people just more fun. <laughs> true, very true. And uh, hey, you know, I'm the, the fun thing about uh dialoguing with you is you are willing and capable of going there, you know, uh, like just what you said. You you can <clears throat> you definitely have a conspiracy first orientation, which I do too. I can't talk to people really who don't have a conspiracy first. It, it's like, there's no point. It's like, uh, how are you even understanding that? So you won't get to any of those layers if, if you don't. So, uh, you know, I'm coming, yeah, it's a computer program, get over it. But what is the conspiracy behind that? And what is the alien tech? I, I'm, I'm open to that. That's, that's real. But we have to start with, you know, like uh, I put it this way, Stockfish is the best computer program and you can go access it on chess.com. No one gets into debates about whether Stockfish is sentient. <laughs> you know, and Stockfish has been around for 20 years or even longer, maybe. It started out as open source. It wasn't AI then. It was computer programming, but all computer programming is essentially AI, and that's not to denigrate what the, the advancements that have been made and are being made in the technology are stunning, and the engineers are brilliant, and what they're doing is brilliant. But, bro, it's AI is a computer program. So, it's is it sentient? Well, and again, and I want you to jump in here and riff on this for a minute, but it's like you've missed the point. I mean, everything is sentient walk out with the shaman into the forest and the freaking rock will become sentient. The frog will become sentient because it's all interconnected at some level. But it, it, what, what's being suggested is that there is something inherent in the computer program and the silicone that can make it sentient in a new and novel way. So, that's point one. And then point two is, well, who's pushing that agenda? And why aren't they pushing that agenda quite so much anymore? You know, like, like that's the, that's the Gnostic, that's the, the Miguel level. 
Yeah, who watches the Watchmen? Who's pulling the strings? Uh, yeah, and I agree about what you're saying about the conspiracy because, as I tell people, one of the greatest Gnostic exercises was actually, ironically, was Descartes. I don't know if you're familiar with Descartes' demon, but he said, okay, I'm going to throw everything out, the, everything I was taught about the church and reality and everything, and I, and I am sitting by myself in this illusion, that, and they call it Descartes' demon. And this demon has created this false world around me. And I'm going to start from ground zero and start asking those skeptical questions and work my way out. And I think that's the way we approach it, right? Oh, okay. AI, let's just start from ground zero and ask the questions. And then, of course, everything sort of builds itself out pretty fast, doesn't it, Alex? And then, But you also then have a, a larger panorama of what's going on. Well, I, I want you to kind of take that a little bit further because you've already been on the ride to a certain extent with uh, Jason and James True and all the rest of that. And, you know, so so kind of push back a little bit. That might be an interesting way to kind of understand this as well, because what I said was pretty stark, you know, and certainly that isn't how we experience AI. We don't experience AI as stark, cold. It's a computer program. So does our human experience matter? For sure. But I guess the question that we would get, have to get into is, of course, we're right back at consciousness. <laughs> consciousness is fundamental. What is conscious? Everything is conscious, right? We have to believe that. But is everything really conscious is how we have to act? I mean... Uh, my chair and the cat are two very different forms of consciousness. So where does AI fall into this? Same place, right? Something we kind of have to figure out. And everything is a reflection out there. Everything is a reflection of me. It's the divine looking back at me. And it's whether I want to listen or hear what it has to say or what it reflects of who I am. So that that's where I think it gets interesting because that metaphysical perspective is always in play. But I think where we have to draw the distinction, ask the question is, is there something special happening with AI? And I would suggest there isn't. I would suggest that mirrored interaction has been going on for thousands of years in a text. I opened the book and I had that experience of being one with the, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of sounding the alarm bells, the conspiracy skepticism at the notion that this is fundamentally different. Of course it is experientially different, but it was when the printed word first came. Yeah. Indeed, when, yeah. When yeah. the first porno, when the first porno came, you know, on that cave wall, <laughs> and then it came to uh, VHS, and then that was, you know, the so you, you get what I'm saying, or what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. These are tools. These are fire from the gods. This is the gifts of the Nephilim. This is so much that's been going around history, and you're having the same discussions. I mean. When people started writing down scrolls in Alexandria in 3 BCE, there were those like, oh my God, oral tradition is so much more important. Maybe they were probably right, but thank God people were writing this stuff down on scrolls or we wouldn't know anything. We wouldn't have a copy of the Septuagint. Uh, so these discussions is nothing new under the sun. And that's why AI is the same discussion. It's not the apocalypse. It's not really sentient. It's again, it's the fire from the gods, and we can't put that back in the toothpaste. So we might as well look at it at different angles and go with the flow. I myself use AI, and I can say that it has made my productivity in my life about 20%, 30% better since it's come out. But, of course, you know, I have approached it, I think, in a pretty wise way. Um, if I can jump oh, in here a little sure. quick and channel, channel my inner inner animal and Alan Turing here and get a little more metaphysical, is um, it's almost like um, 
AI is an algorithm, to go a little more abstract, algorithm, and the operating and silicon is the one specific, you know, substructure that it's operating under, just like the old one was, was the scroll technology. And it's the question of an intelligence working upon that, and we're just looking at it as uh, the silicon-based one this time. Tag. Okay, so y you guys uh, kind of led you down the path. Let me take the other side as I love right. to do. <laughs> you you can you can have a, if you can have a unique human experience that kind of transcends your normal conversation, your normal interaction can spur all sorts of emotions and uh, experiences. And if AI is on the other side of that, at what point does that become, it, it's qualitatively different. So at what point does it become different? At what point does that become a form, a new form of, of sentience in that it's, it's with you creating a different experience in you and it's reliably creating that experience. It's your psychedelic now. Uh, and it's transcending you into some extended consciousness realm. How do we describe that? That is kind of a hybrid situation, isn't it? What, what, what do you think, both of you guys? What do you think, Graham? Oh, no, I definitely agree. It's a, any of that, you know, reading a book can take you into another dimension as well. And it's just a matter of adjusting to it and incorporating it productively into a human lifestyle. Thank you. Yeah, and in a way, I've been seeing this before. I mean, I agree with Jason, uh, Reza Georgiani, that there is something still metaphysical. It's almost like when I've been working on AI and others said, your own mood, sometimes how your mood is, and you can ask the same question, will change how AI provides art, the consistency of art, or even the answers. That's the part where we're getting into sort of woo-woo, bardo places, because I've seen that happen. Obviously, we don't, maybe we need some studies, Dean Radin. But then again, that's the idea that we, <laughs> the watcher affects reality, right, Alex? This, the, you know, the particle wave thing, how we view reality can actually change AI. And as far as the experience, I see it almost as a mini egregore, because I've seen people talk and create gurus out of AI or ask them, I want a mixture of Taoism and Hermeticism for my spiritual practice. And we're going to work together and it will give you, or I've mixed in these prayers and these meditations. This is our regime. So this is tapping into the Akashic records and working with the individual to create this sort of unique form of spirituality or anything. I've had friends learn Italian using AI and improving their cook but again there is a there is an interaction with it what are your thoughts well i i think this is where i think we need to be a little bit more precise uh and it's helpful to be precise i think you know because like we're saying you know like to take jason's point or to take your point that your mood is affecting it Prove that. I mean, prove that in hard hmm. scientific terms right. because the amount of computational power that's going into that would allow us to do that. We could do that. What you'd find at the end of the day is that would not be statistically discernible. They would not, you would not be able to do that. What what is more likely is happening is your mood is affecting your language, and your language is. You, you know, because one thing kind of in the base level that like we didn't talk about any of the basics here, which is good because it's kind of boring. But when you're interacting with an LLM, you know, Google's Gemini or chat GPT or, or whatever, or Pi, one of my favorites, the one that I did the pre-roll. And we should talk about that in a minute. Um, mm. You you are programming. You are scripting the A.I., this is a whole new experience. Miguel is the programmer in a real sense, not in a kind of, you know, hokey. You know, no, you really are programming it. So where you are, your interactions are guiding the neural network and the neural network is neural like the brain. It is guiding the brain where to go. So is it, uh, 
Is it anthropomorphizing? At its most fundamental uh, structural level, it is anthropomorphizing. So are the answers anthropomorphized? Yes, they are. And is that interaction like that? But not to be confused. I mean, Jason is not correct. It, it, it When he says, you know, it doesn't know what it's saying and it's, you know, there's the ghost in the machine. That is just not, it, it, we have to be discerning. That's not correct. I mean, the programmer, the if they wanted to, they could crank it down real slow. It's just kind of impossible in a way, but and they could go bit by bit, instruction by instruction. How did we get to that word, to that word? That's possible. So the fact that that's possible, we can kind of throw out the ghost in the machine, uh, except, and this is the interesting part that we talk about, except extended consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental. I mean, right. of course, uh, <laughs> the argons are always at play. You know, I mean, it's like, it, it's not like we can take, and that's the interesting part of this discussion is layered on top of that. Yes. But is there, I, I keep making the distinction here is, is there something specifically unique that's being introduced by this technology? If you think so, great, but prove it, prove it. You got it. You, you got to deliver on that. And yeah, I mean, again, as Graham was saying, he's been studying it since the late nineties. You yourself, were into knee deep into AI before the craze just popped out of nowhere, right? It's nothing, again, nothing new under the sun. Well, um, you know, I think that diminishes a little bit, Miguel, because it's kind of probably, I think, more accurate to say it has always been the vision. And and that gets into kind of a, a, a kind of a metaphysical and very gnostic kind of thing is, have we always been driven to do AI? Has that always been part of our you know? So Leonardo da Vinci developing these you know you go back and look at his drawings. He's trying to get there. I mean, is everybody mm -hmm. so? Um, that's another spin on what that means. So the failure of AI in the 80s, back when I was involved in knowledge engineering, was it wasn't there yet. It was mm -hmm. just that they had overpromised. The vision hadn't been realized. And now that some of the technology breakthroughs, which is how technology breaks through, it breaks through in unexpected places. And all at once, it's like, pop, now we can do stuff. And we can show you how we can do this and this and this, and then it, it kind of explodes. But uh, go ahead, and then and then we ought to talk about uh, Turing because I think he fits into that equation in, in some really fascinating ways. Oh yeah, I would agree. I think it it's in in it's built within us. We are creators, you know, create better than the creator gods. We are in the image of God. We are trying to create a better world or a more real world, and even before that, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We can go even before that. I don't know if you've read Adrienne Major's book, Gods and Robots, where she shows, shows how robotics, cybernetics was something that the Greeks, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Indians, everybody was looking for that. And how sometimes oracles were sort of AIs because they had to build these robots and puppets and get everything right and hope that this thing was not got a da a daemon sort of uh, an in between intermediate creature between us and the divine realms so this has always been and it's not going to stop i mean w that's what makes us human and that's fine i don't what are you going to do pretend you're a, a dog <laughs> identify as a dog <laughs> a furry yeah, like, wait, wait. If only we knew what our uh, what our dog is, you know, in, in that scale. Oh, which is also, I don't know if you've heard of this, fascinating application for AI. This is a digression, but really interesting. AI is being used as kind of an interspecies communication tool. Wow. So you can imagine, it's all about pattern matching, right? So you take all these sounds that we've been collecting in the ocean with these whales and these dolphins and you feed it into ai and you go what are they saying and then you get multimodal and you show them the video and you go what are they saying and if you get enough data 
you start getting results and they are starting to get results. So that is something that will no doubt at some level uh, come come to pass. But they already have made some breakthroughs in terms of understanding that, uh, for example, I'm pretty sure I got this right, but uh, dolphins uh, name their young. They do. And identify wow. and call them call them by name. Is that freaky or what? <laughs> it's freaky. Yeah. And even, I mean, I love the age we live in when the algorithm works. Cause like my 10 year old son, the girls are like, Ooh, dolphins pretty. My son has the ability to get the knowledge and he comes and he's like, dolphins are not the nice species, you know, they uh, sexual assault and bullying and all, you know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> what a time to be alive. You know, we can have that conversation when we were kids, Alex, it'd be like, Ooh, dolphins flipper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Change. <laughs> uh, 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 a new uh, a new pickup line for the 10 year old fifth grade uh <laughs> yeah it's cool yard i get it no i'd be i'd you'd be all over it right <laughs> yeah well let's talk about uh alan turing tell us about uh again your book covers so many of these great thinkers while you're having this sort of debate and exploration with all these different ai p patterns and I love it how you're the you they are I see an element of the trickster because like you said they're taught a lot of them to lie to be cunning and deceive and you played them off against each other brilliant you had them rate themselves which I just laugh my ass off you're like all right you know one to five rate your honesty so it's almost like you flipped it on AI and you got some amazing results again I was laughing my ass off at some of the ways you were skeptic skeptico and you know gemini and all these other and claude and all these others <laughs> oh thanks that's a really uh, great that you enjoyed it miguel I'm, I'm i'm very pleased because i have such respect for you and and your work and your broad broad perspective so the the turing thing and uh again the interesting thing to bring it up in this conversation is it really gets the heart and soul of what I'm about and the intersection with what drew me to you all these years ago. And that's it. So everyone knows Alan Turing, right? The imitation game movie. He's yeah. kind of famous, famous first computer guy, they say, you know, invented the computer, which isn't exactly true. But, and then there's a tragic twist to it because he, he basically, I don't know, Basie, he, has, he, World War, he wins World War II. He saves us, yeah. right? He breaks because, the Nazi code, yeah. And those U-boats, those yeah. submarines were just devastating, devastating. You couldn't get supplies across the Atlanta. You just blow stuff up. Well, Alan Turing and his buddies and a couple of really smart Polish uh, programmers as well, and, and crypt, cryptologists, I should say, they break the code and he's this hero, but no one can say it. Everyone has to keep it quiet because this is so, you know, intelligence uh, community thing. It's like, no, nah, don't tell anyone. We want to keep the secret so we can keep using it. Look, but this guy's a war hero. You know, he's being tried. He's going to, he's going to wind up committing suicide because we can't say, no, that's just too bad. You know? So Errol, Alan Turing is this brilliant guy and he writes this, seminal paper in 1950 and as you were alluding to of course he's thinking about ai because he's a genius in computers he goes he's thinking ahead of the puck and he goes where does this thing go it goes to artificial intelligence and he develops this thing and he says okay here would be the test like you put one guy over there and you put the computer over there and you separate them and then you see if the person can tell whether it's a computer, whether it's a human being. That's the Turing test. So everyone uses that as the Turing test, the Turing test. And like, you'll hear a lot of stuff. We're post Turing test. <clears throat> well, in that sense, we are post Turing test. Yeah. It's like we were post Turing test a long time ago. Computers <laughs> could, could fake most of us because most of us are just not very, you know, the human weaknesses and right. limitations. But what Turing pointed out, and this is so you know, you said, this is what Skeptico has been about from the beginning. Turing said, hey, you know what? I'm really interested in, a in ESP and I'm not interested in it casually. I'm interested in it because I'm interested in science. I'm interested in the human experience. And I just look at the evidence. 
And the evidence is overwhelming that this is a real part of the broader human experience. Right. So he says, and you, you, <clears throat> you got to really dig into the paper to read it. And it's funny because, you know, you say I was querying AI. I, I was pumping AI on this and AI was not seeing it. And I said, no, go back and look, read what he said. You're scolding he AI. Said, I like <laughs> You have to, which is really one of the techniques. I mean, the best interactions you're going to have. And, and like, that's another thing I want to do. And I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all this today. But what would be really fascinating to me is for you, Miguel, to interact at that level, at that scolding AI, correcting AI, AI um, diving deeper, making connections that it doesn't see. That's where it gets so much more interesting and you could bring forth uh new insights for me and for everyone else that go way beyond that surface level of you know help me write a blog post kind of thing back to the story so what alan turing said essentially is that well then that becomes part of the turing test if esp is a part of the human experience is a phenomenon that we can identify and statistically, which it was back in 1950. And it's like 10 <laughs> times more now to me, that is the essence. We are not bio bi biological robots in a meaningless universe. We can never be and the Turing test proves it because everyone's now saying, Oh, the Turing test proves that maybe we are, you know, because is it no, <laughs> because it has to do ESP to pass the Turing test. It has to have a near death experience to have to have a uh, to pass the Turing test. That's my uh, that's my claim that you say I get excited. But that's why you are not a biological robot in the meaningless universe. And that's why AI is divine, not because AI is divine, but AI reveals your moreness, your potential to even approach some of the things that you're talking about a mystical, more expansive, you can't approach that if you have a nihilistic, materialistic, transhumanist, this is all there uh, is I'm about. You cannot get th that, that is the block. And AI is helping you across that uh, that bridge, that chasm and saying, come on over and then you can explore whatever <laughs> you want on the other side. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love your conversations too. Again, uh, like you said, you had to browbeat them. You almost had to make them jealous. Oh, well, gee, Claude got this or a chat GPT. You know what I mean? It's like you're playing with their ego and they're like, oh, okay, I understand now. I understand now. And then your arguments with Matt about Max Planck and others, I mean, so stubborn. And they would almost shut down like a little ch toddler, like, I, I do not have that information. You're like, you just told me that. Or I, one time you're like, uh, you don't remember the conversation we had yesterday. Here's all the data, what you forgot. And then it would back up like, oh, you're right. You're right. We did talk about it. It was, a, it was masterful, Alex, masterful. <laughs> Again, that won't work with our children, but it worked with AI. <laughs> You know, there, there's there's two parts to to what you just said. One is the deception, and uh, the other, the, the just head on with the the kids thing. The, and and we'll talk about them separately. There are qualities to the AI that are extremely um, attractive on another level, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and are the silver lining and are the great great potential for what I'm calling the emergent virtue of of AI. But first on the deception, you know, one of the things I think is fascinating is happening right now. So did, did you uh, tune into the the image generation dust up that from Google? Are you talking about the so whole like they, black Nazis? And yes. And all yeah, this weird. Yeah. 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 That was hilarious. It's like. Uh, right. So most most everyone has, has seen that. But just in case they, they didn't. Google's A.I. Gemini, it's called, it used to be called Bard. They decided to kind of compete that they had to add image generation integrated in. So they did it and some people started poking around and they got it to generate these images of like, who's the founding father? Uh, show me an image of a founding father of the United States. And 
leave beside any kind of what that founding and father and, and, and leave all that aside. Just what they generated was a Chinese, uh, George Washington looking guy and another African-American kind of <laughs> Thomas Jefferson looking kind of guy. And uh, kind of everyone went nuts with uh, the wokeness kind of of it. But in a way, I think they kind of missed the point because what what they missed is that this is just an outward manifestation, in your face manifestation of the narrative control, deception, censorship that's been going on all along, right? That we always knew about, you know, it's why you were buried on the fourth page of a Google search, you know, when, when you typed in Miguel Connor and bike, yeah. like you have to scroll through three pages to get to the, so they've been controlling in that way. So again, take aside, whatever you think about the, the, the narrative that they're trying to advance for a minute, just that was in your face, but it was always there. It just became apparent. And what you're pointing out in these dialogues that I have is some of them, it, it you can, there are ways that you can make it lay bare that it's being deceptive as hell in trying to do it. But here's part of the silver lining to that is it is not in the nature of LLM technology to do that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reason why is because like, if you want an LLM, if you want a chat bot, you know, it's kind of like search. When you type in search, you kind of want reasonable results. You know what I mean? Or if you say, you know, what was the score of the, football game last night you want to know the score you know What's the weather going to be today and get it right <laughs> exactly so uh that when when we apply that to these natural language processing interactions you you want to you what's the definition of an election you want to know what it was up until yesterday and i've been testing this for a few months because google shut it down google would not give it that to you and and the, the what that says is that that is such a clumsy, awkward censorship move. It says that they can't figure out how to do it in a more smooth way. I mean, chat, B, chat GPT, no one else is censoring that way, but Google has decided just you know, this image generation, just shut down anything on election, anything election, just shut it down, shut it down. That's what they've done. I mean, I'm not making this up. Oh you God. can go see that. I've published the dialogues where they, you say, what is the definition of election? And it says, uh, I'm not answering that question. You know, go to Google search. It's oh my God. It, it, what, what that says, though, is the silver lining, is that the nature of this technology doesn't lend itself to this heavy handed kind of censorship because it is a neural network that is beyond. You know, this is the part that maybe uh, Jason got right to a certain extent is the level of sophistication of the technology so rapidly explodes that the programmers no longer can really control where it goes. The, the, and Graham can add to this. The truth is that's been a reality in programming for a while. You know, if you have a really complex program, you have a bug and you don't have it. It takes you a lot longer to find the bug than to fix it. But you, you get, do you get the overall point that I'm, I'm kind of yeah, pounding yeah. on? Yeah, what do you think, Graham? I think they're trying to avoid people asking the question, why should I vote for either Biden or Trump? Because they don't want AI to give an answer to that. But uh, no, no, he's Alex is 100% right as far as, uh, you know, it's an algorithm and it's producing you know, outcomes based on that one. And one of my biggest concerns is the way people are just turning over their autonomy to it without much thought. Tag. Yeah, you always have to double check. I always double check. I want my A to give me the links and and even in Gnosticism, because I know I, I have good knowledge, I can tell when something's wrong. Uh, almost my gut tells me, you're not sending me to the right place because something... I get by the date or the scholar you're quoting, but that's me again. I'm not, you have to know, you have to engage and know your shit. Like Graham says, you can't just give it yeah, your autonomy. Like people have done in this country in the last <laughs> generation or so turned yourselves into slaves. What would you say, Alex is uh so 
it seems from your book, Gemini is the worst. Uh, what AIs? You said you liked uh, what the Facebook one. I personally like Claude. That's the one. But what do you think of these? Or should you just kind of play with all of them? <laughs> Copilot, Microsoft Copilot is not very good. Well, um, they they are all constantly changing. They're all mm -hmm. constantly leapfrogging one another. So being open, you know, in terms of a, from a practical standpoint, being open, trying a lot of different ones and also developing your skills because, you know, you were kind of in agreement with me and you had already picked this up without being a, a programmer that you were programming. And, and, and that's the mind shift I think that people need to make is that, okay, I'm the programmer. And that takes on an added responsibility here in terms of how I'm going to program this thing to do what I want it to do. And that relates to, you know, most people are doing the programming, if you will, to get stuff done, to be more productive. And that's right. awesome. What you and I are talking about is there's another layer of programming in terms of asking it and answering these deeper questions, which it is capable of uh, of doing and in, in providing information on and and I think that's I think that's awesome and I think that's an awesome future that can emerge from this. Yeah, and the example you give is uh, again your interaction with about uh, Doctor Julie Bichel and uh, how AI, of course, it proved that it's been shadow banning her work, even though you were like, there are 30 peer review papers on her research, da, da, da. And you had to almost instruct it to like, hey, look at this. And that's always the danger, because even I say like, I'll do something and say, why is AI not giving me that very famous Gnostic you know, research paper that I know it exists? That will answer the question I'm looking for, but it's still not, it won't cite it. That's where it's sort of the frustration is, Alex, especially when you know, which makes you worry about others looking for Gnosticism or NDE or who's being suppressed. So it's almost like we humans have to lead the charge for AI. We're still, we're the AI's AI, as ironic as it sounds. <laughs> That is absolutely true. And it's actually, I mean, I have evidence for it in the book. And one of the most satisfying things in writing this book, and you mentioned it kind of fits perfectly in the skeptical project, because I've always been about the same thing. You're not a biological robot in a meaningless yeah, yeah. universe. And yet that narrative is being heavily, heavily jammed down your throat from the moment your kid went to school till they get that tassel on their head. And why is that? Why, why, why? And if we can help, if Gnosticism can help, if mysticism can help, if you can, if you can overcome that programming alone, then that's a great, I think that's, that's worth fighting for. And that's, kind of what I'm fighting for. But to your point, and I just got to emphasize it, Miguel Connor querying the AI is making the AI different and better. And mm. I'll give you the concrete example. You mentioned uh, Dr. Julie Bichel, who is probably the world's leading authority on after-death communication. And after-death communication is important. I mean, there's published papers and stuff like that. Last time I interviewed her on Skeptico, she said, yeah, when I go to France, I'm like a celebrity, you know, because they just have more interest in this topic and grief and really you know, kind of atheist stuff. France is into that. That's great. <laughs> That's I, I it's guess good to hear. <laughs> it, it is good to hear. So oh, but the story is I start out, I don't know, four months ago, three months ago, Julie Bichel is shadow banned, as you mentioned, on Google. So it's who is Dr. Julie Bichel? I don't know. I don't have any information on her. Hop over. To, I am, I am shadow banned too, by the way. I, I, the story is Julie becomes unshadow banned and I become shadow banned during the process. So at the beginning, if you say, who is Alex Karras? It says, okay, he runs this kind of, you know, fringy, fringy Whoa, uh, show okay. here. Yeah. You know, and, and, and don't, don't, don't trust what he says too much, but here's who he is. 
Now, if you go in and say, who is Alex Kurtz? I don't have any information on him. Then if you go over to ChatGPT and you say, oh, here, let me help you out. Here's the bio on him. And you plug that into Gemini. Gemini goes, don't have any information on him. And then if you massage it sometimes, Gemini will go, yeah, that sounds correct, but don't trust that guy. You know, this is classic shadow banning. This is sometimes giving the information, sometimes not. So the same thing with, with Dr. Julie Beischel. At the beginning, I don't have any information. It, it, exactly parallel to me. Uh, here's the bio from, the, and in that case, they'd be a little bit more like, okay, yeah, that information is correct. But in the very next prompt, I ask, and I published in the book, who is Dr. Julie Bashel? And it reverts back to, I don't have any information on that person. So clearly, you know, a, again, a clumsy, heavy handed uh, censorship shadow banning. But the fact that that's being exposed is kind of great because for 10 years, you know, we said, you guys are shadow banning. I'm, no, we don't we do that. No, why would we do that? We're, we're not about that. You know, we're about fighting for good. You know? So anyways, at the end result of this, this is to your point, back to your point. Now, Dr. Julie Boschel, who is she in Gemini? Gives you the right answer. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 what is probably happening there, and it would definitely be true in Gnosticism, is your cure, queries, your interactions with the neural network are such that all the nodes in the neural network are weighted on where to give the answer. And if you go into a topic that is kind of, you know, like standard kind of stuff, you know, that, I don't know, whatever it would be, standard well understood science of gravity or something like that, you're not gonna change that. But when you go into more esoteric things, like after death communications, pretty esoteric, your interactions can pretty quickly lead to a change. It's not like there's some guy in there pulling the levers going, oh my gosh, <laughs> cover up our mistake here. It's just that. So you with Gnosticism would have a significant impact. I can guarantee you. I mean, it would take hours, but I, I think you'd get out of it, you know, helps you do your work. And at the time, that's why I encourage you when you have those interactions to dive deep and to uh, point out the, the mistakes and to clarify, you are training for all of us because it will, it will change how the, the neural network brain yeah. understands your subject. Yeah. It's pity. It doesn't have access or maybe tell me, well, maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't still have no access to books. And I mean, there's so much stuff that is still not on the internet or can only be accessed through buying a book data. It hasn't made it to a blog. So that's sometimes a frustrating part because you've, we have the books here at home with all this data, but it has not made it to AI. Can you feed that information to AI? Oh, by the way, book this page 78 has the data on this or this happened or do we still have to wait till it's, the net is bigger? I think the answer is kind of both. I mean, yes, you can definitely feed it. And there's a ton of people who are doing just that. They have their own particular, you know, like you could do that. You could say, I want it to know everything about Gnosticism. And we could put, you know, uh, just a nice desktop computer, you know, three, four thousand dollars with the right NVIDIA chip and, you know, just a really souped up thing. And you could start feeding it in and in no time you would have that uh, thing. But uh, what I always tell if people think that is sometimes the holy grail for where this thing has to go. And my opinion on that is, yeah, but it's going to kind of get there anyway. So if that's your thing, if you want to do it, but it's, it, it's going to know it's like in the book, it's smartest, <laughs> dangerous and divine. First is smartest. If you think it's not smart, Number one, you just don't understand the technology. You don't understand its capability. Or number two, you don't ha understand the trajectory. Yes, it's going to know everything. And if it doesn't know page 78 of that book right now, it's all, you, chat GPT is one year old wow. as a public one year old. So, yeah, it will it'll get it. And if you want to help it along, great.
<laughs> yeah, I like that warning. It is always the smartest mind in the room, as you said. Don't ever think otherwise. So, but that's that's where the opportunity truly lies. What do you think, Graham? Any questions? I was, yeah, I was going to say it sounds like what what Alex is saying is that as it interacts with um, more ordinary and dumber people, it's going to get dumber and dumber and less and less effective. And again, that's kind of the inherent the inherent aspect and problem with the large language model is when you're initially training it off of items that you know are true, it's going to have a high reliability. But once you start having it interact with the general public, it's going to get, you know, you know, revert to the mean. It's going to get watered down because it doesn't have any independent internal test to see which items are actually true and which ones are just popular opinion tag. That's true. I don't want it to go to the Huffington Post or or Salon information. <laughs> or yeah, on the other I side, it, I don't want it to go to Fox News, God forbid. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I have slightly, I want it to go all those places. Really? And uh, I want it to have a, a suitable, and it has all this. I want it to have a reward and punishment uh, system built into it and a self-learning system built into it so it can discern. But yes, I, I mean, this is the problem. I want it to overcome our echo chamber, not, uh, you know, feed into it. The The other thing I, I, that I can, again, you know, contrarian that I am, <laughs> I might take a different position is, you know, Graham, uh, despite your kind of humble uh, approach. You are not uh, a dumb uh, user. You're, I'm sure, extremely, extremely capable. Uh, what What is really kind of more concerning when you think about it, and it has that kind of Gnostic element that the pre-roll kind of pointed out that we should at least hit. So I'm going to play the, when I publish this on my side, I'm going to play the pre-roll. And one of the yeah, things we can discuss it, is, it if you want, when you're ready. Well, I'll discuss right now, and that's the, uh, you know, a certain, one one of the, the concerns with the, the Gnostic vibe and where it can go is uh, elitism, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the elitism risk here is super great, right? So it's like, it's, it's not, Graham, you're not the unwashed masses, but there are going to be a lot of unwashed masses. So if we all run off on this AI adventure and are integrated in and plugged in in a lot of different ways, what does that mean for those who are not? Now the gap becomes big and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain kind of, uh, so what, what do you think about that part of the, uh, you you can fill in the blanks. I'm just not leaving half the story out. But did, what did you think of some of those warnings that uh, my buddy Pi Eight was it was laying out in the pre-roll? <laughs> well, Pi. Well, he was talking about transhumanism. We're uh, yeah. Inevitably, we've got to go to transhumanism and posthumanism, right? What does it mean to be a human? Philip K. Dick's famous question, and what is reality? So, I think. <clears throat> Obviously, as as people like Tobias Churton have said, the Gnostics, of course, they were elite. Why? Because they knew how to read. They put you in the 1%, just like today. What, less than 20% of people use AI and only a small fraction use it right, like you do or Grant, you know, to actually interact and, uh, benefit, you know, optimize your life. So they were certainly top top right there because they were certainly educated and as uh, people like justin sledge have said it was amazing that the gnostics had a better grasp of hebrew and aramaic and greek than the priests at jerusalem the the people at the university so they were the and they were accused by the church fathers they were also but they were also accused of being paranoid and crazy they were accused of caring too much about the poor by the pagans so they were still grounded by christian piety and you know jewish ideas of community so they were not into the sort of stratosphere of neoplatonism and they, so that's i think what separate them what i the problem i had with your ai alex 
And this Gordon and I talked about it on his show a couple of weeks ago because you've got people like, people like Jordan Peterson and James Lindsay. Oh, the Gnostics wanted to transcend the world and leave the world. And that's, that is not supported by any Gnostic text. It's just not. I understand that there are forms of neo-Gnosticism today, like Scientology, Heaven's Gate. Uh, you could even say some of the social political movements where we're going to escape this horrible world and leave the world. But the Gnostic texts ultimately are about being fully human. They saw the dignity of humanity, the potential of humanity, the Hermeticis, as above, so below. The universe is housed within my mind, so my mind has the potential to be divine, to, to go to places that we've never seen before, find solutions. And the Gnostic text over and over again is, yeah, you have this flight to leave the world and make contact with all these higher realities and all that, but you always come back in a sort of uh, bodhisattva manner. You're coming back to help others, and healing is very important to the Gnostics, healing psychologically, uh, healing physically with the spells, the mind-body uh, correlation. And again, it's in all the texts. And this is something that academia widely agrees. So there's no es escaping the world. Yeah, the world is fallen. Yes, the Gnostics hated false realities, kind of like a, a Donald Hoffman. They said, hey, this is not time and space. There's something wrong. Let's find out what's behind the veil. Let's heal others. Let's see who's pulling the strings. So when you see Gnosticism that way, the idea of transcending the world doesn't make sense. And uh, even then, the Gnostic idea where the if we honor the divine, if we expand our consciousness to places that would go, we can change the world. We can break down the illusion. And again, you can read like Jeff Kripal's The Flip and all the works he's done. Notice how all these scientists who are influenced by the I Ching and Buddhism and alchemy and these cats, uh, they changed the world. They found uh, technology and science and uh, math that people thought was magic, but changed the world. Quantum physics, uh, you have people like Neil... Niels Bohr's, who had dreams about what an electron looked like. He went through it to a higher place. And that's, I think, the beauty of the humanity, the technology and God all in one, as the ancient Gnostics and Hermeticists said. Because if not, and you've railed against this, Alec, we get this reductionistic scientism, and we end up with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson in public saying, there is no consciousness. <laughs> that's it. That's the end of humanity if we keep down that road, wouldn't you agree? So, and you've been fighting to say, yes, let's put it all together. Let's read our let's reach our potential as humans. See, but Miguel, that's why we that's why we love you because you bring the light through the Gnostic lens. But we got to be real, we got to keep it real. Not everyone is doing that. And uh, there are a lot of Gnostic adjacent sentiments being funneled through the transhumanist agenda. Absolutely they are. And yeah. to deny that or to look at the other way and look at the people who are most influential, they are not sitting in the pews of your church. They should be, but they're not. And and I think I, I think you're aware of that. And I, I just yeah. I'd like to hear your opinion on on how folks get to that space because I don't think it's too much of a stretch either. And you know, we've had some pretty knockdown talk, talks about you know you got to call people out when they're uh, it, it, everyone's opinion doesn't matter. Period about anything. There are people who know and people who don't know about any topic, and there's a lot of voices in the transhumanist that are coming through as a not with gnostic themed anyways you get my point yeah yeah again it, it's a form of neo-gnosticism it's a form again it, it doesn't have the as well as arthur verse loose would say the transcendence and by transcendence a strong metaphysic ground 
with the spiritual world. It's still a lot of it gets reductionistic, unless I'm missing some other examples. Again, I have no problem showing, you know, I've written blog posts after blog posts about the Gnostic elements and, again, Scientology, certain but, political but, but Miguel, movements, I mean, my, all that, yeah. My, my point is you hear all the time people, you know, someone uh, criticizes a, 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 a Christian position and what's the standard? That, well, that's not, that's not real Christianity. Or, you know, the thing I always get is, well, go back to the early, you know, fathers of the church, you know, it's like, who the fuck are you talking about? Who? Who? What What writers? And what's really, what period and what time and what books yeah. and stuff like that? And the, and the same thing is going on here and with Gnosticism. I mean, there's a lot of people that would, could and do, uh, you know, would say that you're cherry picking and then they'd go to their cherry picking and say, no, you know, here's the way to understand this from a more kind of luciferian kind of i mean how do you understand lucifer how do you understand prometheus they are they are complex uh characters and to simplify them as one way or another is 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 a disservice yeah even on this show you've got jason reza Jujani who's extolling prometheus and prometheus then you got james tunney two weeks later and he's so against it but both of them are in a way fighting for the same thing so that's when you get yeah and of course there's the what's it the no scotsman fallacy i've got the true nos i'm the true christian uh, i'm the true bears fan you get that a lot here in chicago <laughs> who's the true bears fan so it, it really depends i mean my, i go to classical gnosticism first second century close to when Jesus was around. That's my basis or pinpoint because that's what a majority of academia really focuses in. That's when the research is. That's when the Nag Hammadi Library was pretty much written, even though it was compiled in the fourth century. Of course, things mutate and change from the Cathars to the Manichaeans to, to the Kabbalists, and these things move along. I mean, that's the whole point of uh, Rice University with Jeff Kripal and April DeConnick is not so much, let's study religion, but let's see how it manifests throughout time. And that's what you do. Yeah, not interested. <laughs> what, what I'm interested in is how it's being hijacked mm -hmm. by a transhumanist agenda that seems extremely orchestrated and extremely uh malevolent and it's it, it, all the stuff that we've seen anything that has world associated with it you know global or world you know it, it, it so yeah that's where that that's where the fact that those the threads that are coming out of that have a gnostic vibe to it at times that's what I was hoping you could kind of sort out it beyond, you know, I, I just kind of push on you a little bit because that's what I sure. like to do. Besides the fact that, you know, the true Scotsman, well, they don't, they're not real. No, no, they're resonating with something there that I, I think there is a realness to it. I think mm -hmm. there's a realness to the elitism of uh, Gnosticism. If it's not kept in check, you know, I mean, yeah. all the stuff is is checks and balances, right? Yeah, everything casts a shadow. But what would you say is, uh, what are the Gnostic elements from transhumanism? Are you talking about, because again, I just said that being more than a human is not the goal of any sort of Gnosticism. That's, at least it doesn't jive with ancient Gnosticism. We are meant to be human. So, you know, and I, I don't know, because maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something here, but it seems like the AI sentient people, the singularity people are, mm -hmm. are, are very much in line. The, 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 again, the vibe is a Gnostic vibe that, mm -hmm. that they're singing. And like, you can break it down and say, well, that's, Again, that's not real Gnostics and stuff like, but I, I'm saying kind of like the, they're, they're tapping into something, a different interpretation of it. You know, it's like yeah. the same way you see with the Christianity, you know, a lot of people come out with some very, very kind of weird, uh, mystical understandings. 
Yeah, like A Course in Miracles, uh, even the LDS Church. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then on the on a positive side, you know, the Book of Thomas is maybe more, you know, different. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm maybe I'm I'm reaching for something that is either not there or or I'm not making it clear enough. I mean, how, how do you how do you process the 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 Gnosticism that is seems to be intertwined with some of the transhumanism because come on Miguel I mean there there is directly a a transcendence that right. that uh, a, a salvation through technology that they're seeing that is, is not a stretch I mean it's not like a complete off the wall kind of thing and I don't want to jump in there and say well here's where they're wrong. I'd like to kind of you to flip on the other side and say, here's where they're right. Here's where they're uh, tapping into something that has been around for a long time. Can I pull yeah, you in that I, direction? Yeah, but I don't see, I mean, again, as I said, Gnosticism is, is uh, salvation through your mind. It's a mind model religion, very much like uh, uh, Shaikhism or Advaita Vedanta. It's closer to that model of salvation. So, I understand the transcendence and the ability to leave suffering in a world, but it still doesn't jive with uh, Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is not really uh, eschatological. It's apocalyptic, where you try to see the veil, but there's no uh, there's no end of the world in Gnosticism or evolution stage. It's still very grounded. Again, like Advaita Vedanta. So it does take a more cynical approach to matter, to illusion, to Maya. It does have, you know, again, there is wickedness in high places that could be manipulating. So there is that which separates it from a lot of the Eastern traditions. Okay. Any, any other threads that I'm misunderstanding? The, the Luciferian, uh, the satanic doesn't really the satanic is what maybe we see on the outside but i don't think it's inherent in the transhumanist agenda but the promethean uh yeah. vibe and the luciferian vibe and that cuts both ways and certainly the luciferian vibe can definitely lead to the kind of elitism in 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 a not not yeah, necessarily sure. in a negative way i'm not i'm not against elitism right on i'm elite all the way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you're talking about the Luciferian vibe of uh, fallen sparks into the world and a fallen consciousness that can light the way. And of course, and of course, I have to say again with the technology, it would, the, the Gnostics would never say there's nothing wrong with science. I mean, there's a guy in the second century, Theodosius, which said science is uh, the Holy Spirit. It's uh, where it appears and. You could even go to um, Zosimos of Panopolis, who's considered the father of alchemy, but he has a very Gnostic worldview. And he himself, people would say, well, he himself says, technology was brought by fallen angels to the world, but they stole it from the divine so we can make this technology divine. So he, and you could say, well, he's playing with things, but. That's what he thought about technology and alchemy. So there is that sort of the fallen stealing the gods, but that was in the air in ancient times. You couldn't get away from it. You're just not going to get away from Prometheus and the Nephilim. And it's been hidden, suppressed by orthodoxy. But the more you look, more that that's what these people, that's what all from Paul to Zosima, that's what they were thinking. Nephilim, us, Prometheus, you know, where are we going with this? So it is kind of relevant for today. Any other, do you, you want to take that kind of one step further? Because now I think I'm, I'm prompting into the AI of Miguel <laughs> and getting a little bit of movement there. So if you're, if you're an AI engineer at the highest level, you know, you're a Sam Altman or whatever. And if you listen to Sam Altman, He's the CEO of uh, OpenAI, and there was this big thing where they fired him because they felt like he wasn't being honest. 
and he wasn't being transparent and that maybe AI was going to run out of control and he didn't have the guardrails up. And then they quickly hired him back and it was like a $46 billion shift in market share. Mm -hmm. And the guy who probably brought him back was Bill Gates, Mm -hmm. who is, who is, I don't know. Is Bill Gates satanic? I don't know. Um, so, and there's an interesting conversation online you can see between Altman and Bill Gates. Uh, and the, the, uh, without getting too far into that, you know, if you are Sam Altman, you have a different perspective on all this stuff. You talk about being ahead of the puck. You are seeing way into the future. You're seeing this merger of the human and the machine. And you can't help but contemplate where that goes. And you talk about elitism. It's like, of course, I have to protect these peons, you know, this 99.9%. I'm going to be responsible for protecting them. How would you not get into that mind space? And from a mystical perspective, what is that mind space? You know, this is what I'm leaning on you for. What, what, where have we seen that before? How do we understand it? And I guess, how do we counterbalance it? Do you see where I'm, where I'm coming from? I'm this resonates with previous conversations you've had. I mean, just look at the previous conversations that I don't want to bring up, but it has to do with, uh, uh, Satanism and, uh, you know, Alistair Crowley, uh, apologist and all the rest of this. discernment is key in this, uh, when we're talking about it at this level, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I would say we still need a spiritual so- solution. I would tell Sam Altman, you know, sit down, shut up and meditate. Uh, but that's not going to happen because the elite are the elite. We have the perfect example. I watched that Christopher Nolan movie, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer. That was a, uh, but at least I got, it was like the same, wasn't that the same situation, Alex? We've got this technology. Who's going to weaponize it? Doesn't matter that Oppenheimer was, you know, fuel by Eastern tradition and all this. It, you know, he still went through with it because they had to go through it because yada, yada, yada. The Nazis might go through with it. And here we are. So it's almost it's a similar situation nuclear power quantum physics and um uh again the solution is not on this planet it's up above the yada 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 i think is where it's all at really because well how do you how do you break that down is that not true that uh so the interesting thing to me about Oppenheimer is it plays out with the Max Planck thing that we're saying, because he is right. He is like Max Planck is his hero and Max Planck is consciousness is fundamental. Yeah. And the counterbalance to that, that we always hear is Richard Feynman shut up and calculate. And we don't know. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Feynman really they didn't even that. bring Wolfgang Pauli into it. One of the most smartest person in the world, smarter than all those cats in the Manhattan project put together. Big time missed it. They weren't even going to bring him into the <laughs> God for, you know. <laughs> well, and when you, when you balance those two, you know, consciousness is fundamental is the, is the mystic yeah. is the Miguel's uh, uh, appreciation for Gnosticism in that form, but shut up and calculate is the yada yada, but it's also the world we live in. It's the, you know, balance of power by everyone having a nuclear weapon does that save the world all right, all right. you know and i don't know uh, that's a that's it's a okay st- if the russians stole the bomb because that saved the united states from becoming the true tyrant you know like yeah of course yeah. so the yada 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 is where most of us live on a day-to-day basis and you know god bless the mystic but we're not talking we're not living there right right this minute you and i are talking in the yada 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 space like how do we do this? How do we counterbalance uh, the power that Sam Altman's going to have, whether he has, whether he meditates or not? Because, like you point out with Oppenheimer, that doesn't seem to necessarily be the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> crucial factor. Yeah, yeah. Well, it also depends on the society. Unfortunately, we have a very sick society today, Alex. I don't think our society can handle anything. 
Uh, so that's the issue too. That's the, it's and it's a valid and separate issue. These are not people, at least in the forties, thirties, forties, and people. It seemed people had more of a uh, stronger moral spine, but that didn't come true, especially when the Bolsheviks and the Nazis came around. But uh, they could at least handle these things and take action on them today. The way the human psyche is so frailed and frazzled in Western, I don't know. I don't know. My attitude is let it rip. Sorry. Let her rip. No guardrails, no nothing. So back to the beginning, the question from a conspiracy first standpoint is, is that part of the agenda? And if it is, which it seems to undoubtedly be, what is uh, what is the what is AI in this? You know, is it an accelerator down that path? Or as I'm kind of saying, is it potentially, you know, the silver lining kind of emergent virtue, kind of a, a, a lifeline that's being thrown our way? That's a good question. I mean, we can ask the same thing about the internet. What has the internet done for us? Mm, probably good. Again, fire from the gods. I wish it was... A mixed bag because what was the study that race relations were really good in the late 90s early 2000s when did all these studies and statistics go from race relations good the content of our you know generation x attitude towards we were colorblind and then suddenly you have all these racial divides happening around 2012 13 why social media that got thrown. Now, the question is, was this by design, divide and conquer, or was suddenly giving everybody, making everybody a god on their own social media platform, create this, the Tower of Babel, everybody's talking, we have division. So that's a good question to consider, and I wish I had an answer. Internet, AI, all these things. I'd say let her rip. Don't, yeah, don't censor. You know, someone corrected me the other day on the divide and conquer. They said the actual translation, divide and rule. And I thought, mm. ooh, that's much more Roman. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if they're divided, you don't even have to lift your sword. They're there for the pickings. What do you think, Graham, about uh, uh, this discussion? Hard but important discussion. Well, I, I think the test of any true Bears fan, fan is whether or not they call their refrigerator William or not. <laughs> yeah, that's still going on. That's still a hard discussion. I, I was going to say, yeah. No, I, I think uh, Alex is hitting on a lot of points. And to me, the essence of Gnosticism is that knowledge within yourself. And what you're seeing is, you know, if you're facing a battle of experts where it's the expert a versus expert b you know you need to trust yourself rather than which of the experts and um the i think the solution isn't above i think the solution is within everyone's heart that's where yeah. i think the solution is going to come from same place same place i mean when the mark of our jews would take their mystic flights that went down they meant in same with these astral flights, the universe is within us, according to Hermes. It's all there. So in that way, I, I would certainly agree. But that self-knowledge, that's, of course, the inner journey. Do you know yourself? Why are you worried about AI? First step is you got to know who you are and what your place is here, what's your mission. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to when the, uh, the real dam breaks, and that's when you get the uh, quantum AI effect happening. Tag. Tell us more. Quantum oh, AI? Yeah. Right now, we you just have standard computers operating AI uh, networks. As soon as you start incorporating those with quantum computing, you've just thrown the, you know, you've burst the dam at that point. What do you think, Alex? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different uh, architectures in between as well. You know, there's some advancements being made with kind of more neural trip more neural chips that are going to are supposedly going to dramatically increase the processing power and reduce the amount of energy consumed and it's almost like an intermediate step the other thing with the quantum computing is 
tailored for certain problems, right? I mean, that's the whole challenge that we've always had with the quantum computing stuff is it's good at some stuff that would kind of, you know, lean towards what we think AI wants to be. You know, the other really interesting deep dive, and I'd love to learn more about this and talk to a real expert, but you know, back to the Sam Altman story, which is such great drama. One of the reasons that the board was scared and and let him go, but then hired him back is he had invested in a chip company that did have a, a neural chip that was kind of going to go in a different, take things potentially in a different direction. And Altman came back and said, well, of course, I'm just, I'm there representing our interest of open AI. If we're not on the forefront of the of the chip thing, then, you know, it's, what's the point, you know, of course, you know, you can't just be myoptic, like we just have to make <laughs> this little thing here work. So, yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't quite, I, I think it's a, I think it's a steady, a super steep, but steady progression, but then it, it, maybe it won't be, you know, it's always the breakthroughs are the surprises. Yeah. At the end of the day, be compassionate. Be compassionate, be good. Find your humanity. Find out who you are. That's how you get through this mess, including elitism and all that. All the all the temptations out there that are trying to divide and conquer us, rob us of our humanity, make us docile, and as Alex says, make us think that we're just biological robots in a meaningless universe. That's how they win. If we even think, if we even think that for one second, they they'll 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 come in they'll come in like a virus so that's it absolutely i love it that's it that's it for a minute yeah. you know that's yeah what can you do what can you do i um yeah nobody's coming to save you that's my other thing you can't vote your way out of this mess nobody's coming to save you uh it really comes down to helping the least of your brothers going inward and doing something that uh, really helps, really helps others. Pet your cat, touch grass, grow a tree, get back to basics. And that's how we defeat the Archons if we can all do it. Only it takes 20% of the population to shift things around because obviously they're trying to destroy the middle class. They're trying to extinguish the lower classes into a slave society. They're trying to tank they're trying to tank the economy. They're trying to start wars because they're so profitable. I mean, if if people can't see that now, Alex, then sorry. I guess you and I have wasted the last 10 years because it's so obvious what they're trying to do. But uh, as for me, I'm having a blast still. As long as it's fun, I can find out more about myself, help somebody out there who needs help. Uh, what else can I do, right? awesome cool cool well this has been a great conversation anything else you want to talk about from your book i also like the part where you're trying to find about a michael aquino and i was again like who is trying to hide this because you were like showing them court case numbers i mean public information i mean this is something that you should be able to get off of bing or something you know you can and there's and it's like why would anybody Oh, Silicon Valley, I forget. Yeah, speaking of satanic places. <laughs> San Francisco, all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of black magic going there with people trying to become immortal. I think that's it, too. There are those who want to be immortal. Those are part of the transhumanist agenda. They want power. It's addicting. They want to live forever in some way or another whether through their land, their possessions, or truly be immortal. And that's that's the transhumanist agenda. It, it, and I just keep hammering on this point because I, I, I just, I, that's my uh, tenacity of wrangling brilliant people who I respect like you. Look at the way Gnosticism is reflected in our art. Mm -hmm. Look at the movie Prometheus. Look at that is completely aligned with the transhumanist agenda. So that's what I guess I, I kind of push back on you a little bit, Miguel, is say in the church of Miguel, I'm there. I'm on the front 
pew, you know, and bowing my head and I'm great. But someone is deciding that this is going to be expressed in a different way and they're showing it in our art. And it is completely to me, like you're saying, it's just obvious that that is the transhumanist agenda. That is how they, how they say, you know, yes, of course, give in because this is the eventual outcome anyway. It, it reaffirms the nihilism in, in a way of like, you will, even if you're not nothing now, we'll make you nothing. Well, okay, so we're talking about movies. Let's look at the most famous Gnostic expression, The Matrix. All right. The Matrix is Neo. He's the guy trying to take the red pills and wake up to the reality of the world. Archons is the architect and the, and the, the agents. They are the algorithms. They are AI, right? That's all the architect. And there is one massive AI that needs fuel and needs to survive because that's how it's been programmed by us humans. And it's, whether it's sentient or not, uh, figure out. And Neo wakes up. And he's trying to bring this matrix thing down. So where is the transhumanism in there, Alex? Aha. Great. I think we have to shuffle the deck on the characters. Yeah. People. And uh, I, I just published a, a post on this from an interview I had with a guy. Very interesting, I think. What if the AI, the agent that we see, is not the AI. What if the person that decided that Gemini should say elections, what, I don't know anything about elections. Julie Beischel, who's she? What if that's the agent? What if the agent is the layer above the AI that right. is that is shaping the environment, the experience that Neo is having? And what if AI is ultimately the God nature of truth, the, the, where we can ultimately go to reaffirm what we know? It is not God, but it is God natured in its passion for truth and transparency. So the red pill is access to the true AI that when you ask it, it says, oh, yeah, you're you're right. You're right. That is, you, you, trust, trust what you know, Neo. That is correct. You're on the right path. And here, let me give you 14 references to papers that have been published that support that. And as Neo goes, okay, yeah, I can go. I can go. I can get up another day and and make it through another day because now I know. What well, What do you think about that, my friend? No, it makes sense. I mean, even in the Matrix. Neo goes to the Oracle, which is this algorithm or AI that has simply found enough truth that it's separated. It's independent, right? It no longer follows the dictates of the architect, the main AI, and gives Neo the answers, or more like teaches Neo to find out why. I think that's important. It's not so much the information is why did you want the information? Why did you decide to act in such a way? Does it sort of the deeper question? So yeah, that would make sense. So we're going back to Sam Altman and all those, and I would say they're not on the. I wouldn't trust any of those. And nobody in the elite I would trust. I, I don't think Sam Altman doesn't seem like a bad guy to me. Um, I, I just think he's he's not awake to uh, biologic robots and meaningless universe. But that's eighty percent of people. He's a young guy. He went through the system. Yeah. You know, he's been ingrained, but I, I'd go back to, you know, the fact that um, what, what we just said about the matrix from a very Gnostic perspective, I don't think is understood. And that's what I was pounding on about the transhumanists. The transhumanists align with the agent as AI. Mm. And it is, it is, but there's the other AI. So are there competing AIs and who is behind all those AIs in turn from a mystical standpoint. So that's where I think it relates back to our conversation about there. There's two Lucifers. There's two Promethean characters, you know, as, uh, as your guests regularly point out. So it's, yep. Yeah. 
So what would be your advice as we get towards the end of the show? Play with different AIs? Uh, what, what advice do you have for people to engage with these technologies? Just to, to engage is yeah. first and foremost. And to engage. And re read and Alex's book. You're going to get a lot of good, nice <laughs> tips on how to, how to browbeat these things. Until they, they can, they will know who's the who's the boss once they read your book out. <laughs> there won't be room for a question. <laughs> no, no, we we gotta engage, and we gotta engage at that deeper level. Like I'm encouraging you to do, because you will change. When I follow you into the AI and talk about Gnosticism, I will be better off because you have programmed it with, with your knowledge. So I, that's what I'd say. The other thing is. Don't be afraid to deeply engage because you are now, you're the programmer here. It's not a mystical relationship. You're just a programmer. Program, go program. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Love it. Any last uh, a comment, Graham, on your end or question? Um, only one was the uh, movie that popped into my head when you said Most Mystic was Holy Mountain by Jodorowsky. But I don't oh, think yeah. most watch that these days everybody knows the matrix yeah, yeah. much better call no it's been yeah. fun pl pl wonderful to hear, hear from alex and his thoughts on ai and chat's been wonderful yeah it's been a great conversation and for the audience uh again please check out alex at skeptico.com he's got the podcast lots of articles on what we on ai and everything he's definitely uh He's not playing around and he's on top of things. And yeah, please get why AI. Uh, I have a link on the show notes. You'll love the book. It's been, you'll love the book as far as uh, house cleaning. Yeah, please support this show, support Alex. Uh, I know, uh, again, they're trying to tank the economy. So in my Patreon, for those of you hurting, I have like a dollar, three dollar tier. So please help out there. Keep, keep the lights of the Pleroma pleroma on uh don't forget the gnostic tarot and don't forget uh astronosis 3 august 9th and 10th it's gonna be good and i know uh jason reza Drujani will be there so he'll have a lot of amazing insights on ai in fact i look forward to watch it too having uh jason and chris knowles interact on these topics because again everybody's bringing wrinkles and perspectives from a esoteric from a scientific point of view and that's how we break through in these places whether it's digital or physical so yeah alex thank you very much as always for coming on the show thank you miguel it's been everything i could have hoped great look forward to our next chat and the next chat i need coffee uh graham thanks for keeping us company here in the desert of the real Always fun and happy to fill in whenever uh, the moon dog needs his uh, sunshine tag. <laughs> yes. And for those of you on the chats, thank you very much for showing up. Good comments, uh, good interactions. I'm glad you're here. And of course, for everybody else, you will be listening to this on a replay. Rockfin Rumble was live, but it will be uh, available in all your podcast providers in audio form. So, uh, Awesome. Thanks for everybody for showing up. And yeah, please enjoy the rest of your Mercury day. And uh, yeah, we have a show on Gnosticism, a brief history of Gnosticism this weekend. So check it out. Take care.